We enter into a discussion on something that is probably unfamiliar to most, if not all of you, uh, the idea of positivism. And um, I have the barest of acquaintance with it. Uh, I remember um, coming across it in surveys of philosophy. Um, I believe the uh, principal philosopher behind it was a fellow by the name of A.J. Ayers, A-Y-E-R-S, A.J. Ayers. Um, and I just did a quick re review of its basic uh, import, and that is that um, you are to uh, come to your understanding of the world based on observation. It's an empirical approach to things. What you see is uh, evidence for you, and then you make logical deductions on what is observed, and you don't go beyond uh, what is observed. So. Um, it, it, it becomes a way of denying really the truth claims of scripture, uh, metaphysics, which is the idea of being, reality, the existence of God, the nature of God, uh, even the nature of the world to a certain extent. But um, So that, that's a little bit a, a, a hook for the idea of logical positivism. Really, is, it, it's just... <laughs> Uh, the same sort of thing you get every day today, where the emphasis is on experimentation, on observation, uh, and then logical reasoning from that. It, it's basic empiricism uh, with an emphasis on logical deduction. So I suppose it tries to, in some respects, fuse rationalism uh, with empiricism and try to bring them together, the, the logic and the reasoning of rationalism into the observation and empirical uh, study uh, of the world around us. That works its way, interestingly enough, into uh, religious faith and uh, it's had its impact on uh, the church or, over the course of history and apparently was very uh, influential, especially in the time of Machen. So he's going to talk a little bit about positivism and so this is kind of the, the, the background for that. Uh, it's a skepticism, essentially, of um, a religion, um, metaphysics, um, authority. Uh, so the Word of God speaking with the authority of God is something that is uh, not easily accepted by the logical positivist. So it, it's one uh, way of reminding us that the things that happen in philosophy are not just ivory tower concepts, but they work their way into the culture and also into the church. And many times what happens in the church is that uh, it begins to incorporate these philosophical ideas, bring them into the church under the, the covering of Christian terminology to a certain extent, and say this is a new understanding, an advanced understanding of Christian faith, so we adjust Christianity to match the, the philosophies of the day. And this happens time and time again. We last Sunday spoke from Colossians chapter 2 where Paul warns against uh, empty philosophy and the impact that has. Um, the church at Colossae was dealing with influences from Judaism but also from the paganism around them, the philosophical aspects of that, which was the pursuit of wisdom. Uh, and so the the worship of angels, the severe treatment of the body, were things that had the appearance of wisdom in human philosophy and human traditions. And so Paul is arguing against that sort of thing. Um, philosophy has a significant impact on Christian faith, and we need to be guarding uh, the gates of uh, God's kingdom against those kinds of things. Um, that being said, that I, I, doesn't mean I think that we, we avoid philosophy, we don't study it, we should. I think we should be critical of it, but look at it from the, the foundation of God's Word and the authority that God's Word gives, and that will, I think, help us in that regard. So, with a little bit of background there, um, we'll get into where, where Machen talks about the influence this has had upon the church, particularly through the writings of uh, Professor Elwood. Uh, which he speaks of here. So we'll pick up our reading on page 37 at the paragraph in the middle of the page. Another substitute for a religion based upon the knowledge of God is positivism. Um, I should say we 
did consider just recently mysticism, uh, a flight from reason, a flight into emotion and experience, and the elevation of experience over reason, uh, intellectualism, and these kinds of things. Now, I want to talk about reason and intellectualism here in just a little bit with regard to Machen and his views. But um, the mystic wanted to get, have this religious experience and then clothe that religious experience in some ways with certain ideas of theology which reflect or are symbolic of what the religious experience was but really uh, are not sufficient in and of themselves and that theology can change over time as the experience changes. So now we get into another area of thought, this idea of positivism. Um, he writes, the name itself is due to a phenomenon that appeared long ago, but the thing that the name represents has in all essentials been revived. It has been revived in a, in a rather definite fashion, for example, by Professor Elwood in his popular book, The Reconstruction of Religion. Professor Elwood himself detects his affinity for the older positivism, though he seeks to supplement the positivist religion of humanity with a pantheizing reverence for the world process. But positivism has also been revived, though often unconsciously, by those popular preachers of the day who use the phrase, the Christ-like God which is so distressing to men who have thought at all deeply upon the things at the basis of Christian faith, by those popular preachers who tell us that God is known only through Jesus. If they meant that God is known only through the second person of the Trinity, the eternal Logos, I might perhaps agree. And for my agreement, I might perhaps find warrant in the 11th chapter of Matthew. Uh, that's where Jesus prays to the Father and says, No one knows the Father except the Son and those whom the Son uh, is willing to reveal Him. So Jesus uh, positions Himself as the, the only one through whom we can come to know God. Uh, but He does that as a second member of the Trinity, as a Son of the Father, equal with the Father. And so it's by that avenue that we come to know God. And that's where Machen is saying that uh, he can agree with this idea of a Christ-like God in the sense that the revelation of God comes to us through the mediation of Jesus Christ. But the way that these popular preachers use this phrase, the Christ-like God, is uh, contrary to that, is different from that, and Machen will explain that here. Uh, but he says, uh, But of course, as a matter of fact, that is not at all what they mean, Matthew 11. What they mean is that all metaphysics having been abandoned or relegated to the realm of unessential speculation, all, all questions as to whether there is a God who made the world by the fiat of his will, or whether there is a life after death, or whether Jesus is very, in very person is living today, all such questions having been abandoned, the soul of man may be transformed by the mere contemplation of, and emulation of the moral life of Jesus. Essentially, such a religion is positivism. It regards as non-essential all extra-mundane factors and sets up a religion of humanity, a religion of humanity symbolized by the name of Jesus. So you see here how positivism is skeptical about metaphysical things, existence, being, uh, the existence of God and these kinds of things. And so uh, people talking about a Christ-like God are rejecting those sorts of things and uh, reducing everything to simply the moral life of Jesus. That is what we know because that's something that we can observe and see and make logical deductions from. And that's where the logical positivism comes in. And Professor Elwood is borrowing that and incorporating that into his, um, into his ideas, his advocacy of his point of view. Um, you, you'll note uh, Machen in the paragraph, uh, about the first third of the paragraph, spoke of how uh, he's taken this positivistic religion and pantheized it. So th this is the religious side of logical positivism. L the logical positivism isn't really about religion, but he's incorporated pantheism. So the empirical world which you observe 
is a revelation of God, however you understand this God, it's some world spirit that is undergirding everything. And so Elwood combines these two in this way and then uses this pantheistic view of God to then talk about the true God, which is an idol, it's a falsehood. Uh, and, and then um, Machen talks about the, these popular preachers today who use this catchphrase. Uh, um, concerned that a lot of times today a lot of people are carried away with some popular preachers who have these catchphrases that, that get people's imagination excited and they follow along with that. It's kind of like the Pied Piper of theology. They come along and say something that sounds pretty clever and s seems to have a certain piety to it but people don't do sufficient uh, work to find out what's underneath this and, and what all exactly is going on there and so Satan often in the way that he leads people astray gives us the appearance of the, the you know like the fruit of the the tree in the garden of Eden it looks good it, it, it's desirable desirable to make you wise and it all looks great and then you bite into that and next thing you know you've bitten into that which uh, brings death um, that's Satan's uh, plan so uh, some Preachers sometimes use a lot of catchphrases and stuff to capture people and lead them down the golden path to destruction. So, um, you know, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of men. Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, there's a nice catchphrase that, um, you know, it's kind of like a soundbite in politics that people gravitate to. And, and um, um, well, Black Lives Matter, okay. Well, sure, that sounds great, and people get latched on to that, but there's an underlying philosophy underneath that that people uh, uh, don't notice. So, um, be aware of that. Uh, Machen continues, Certainly the Jesus to whom such a religion can appeal to is not the Jesus of history, neither the Jesus set forth in the New Testament nor the Jesus who has been reproduced, or ever conceivably can be reproduced, by any critical process. For the real Jesus certainly was a theist, certainly did believe in a really existent God, maker of the world and final judge, certainly did accept the revelation of God in the Old Testament scriptures, certainly did place the doctrine of heaven and hell at the very foundation of his ethical teaching certainly did look for a catastrophic coming of the kingdom of God. These things in much modern preaching are ignored. The preacher quotes some word of Jesus quite out of its context, perhaps even from the Gospel of John, which the preacher's own critical principles have discarded, and then proceeds to derive from that misunderstood word of Jesus a non-doctrinal religion of this world. Some of us, as we listen, may desire to ask questions. Some of us may desire to ask whether Jesus of Nazareth really made the more abundant life of man the ultimate end of existence. Uh, Machen here is casting doubt on that assertion that Jesus was simply concerned about man's life here in this world and living the, the abundant life. It's almost as though Machen's anticipating Joel Osteen, uh, Live Your Best Life Now, or whatever the title of that book was that he produced some time ago now. Um, so I'd like to ask some questions. Uh, some of us may desire to ask whether Jesus really left his own person out of his gospel and whether he, we can really reject on any critical principles those words of his in which he claimed to be the judge of the whole earth. But such questions receive short shrift from the modernist preacher. They involve, he says, merely evasions on our part of the moral demands of Jesus. At no point does the passionate anti-intellectualism of the modernist church appear more clearly than here. So many times when you read the modernists, they are hostile to the idea that Jesus identified himself as God, uh, identified himself as the Christ, was self-conscious of that in the course of time, 
Uh, the modernist wants to say, well, this was an idea that was foreign to Jesus. He rejected it for himself if any uh, tried to impose it upon him. And it was only the church in centuries uh, later that elevated Jesus into the idea of a Messiah and a Christ and, and basically clothed him with divinity. And so in that sense, the, um, the modern church is skeptical of those assertions about Jesus. But when you read the scriptures, it's very clear that Jesus considered himself to be fully God, uh, that he came down from heaven uh, and entered into this world, that he spoke with the authority of God, not just giving opinions, and that the obedient life, the moral life that he was uh, uh, demanding of his people was a life in obedience to him. Uh, we are to serve Christ. And that was the... Um, the goal, he spoke with great authority. But the modernist wants to evacuate the person of Christ from the moral standard that he set and just talk about this moral standard because the authority of Christ then gets us into a whole metaphysical area of the divinity of Christ as being the judge of all mankind and all these kinds of things. They want to escape all that. and All they just want is a reductionist point of view of the morality of Jesus love your enemy, do good to those who uh, harm you, and these kinds of things. Um, so this reductionist uh, view strips away the person of Christ from the ethics of Christ and leave, leaves us with a very humanistic ethic, uh, which really is devoid of any power. And, and in the end, why listen to Jesus more than anybody else? I mean, we, we can listen to Mahatma Gandhi, we can listen to... Uh, uh, Confucius, all these wise people of the ages, uh, Muhammad, if you will, um, what privileges Jesus as opposed to others other than you just have an emotional attachment to him? Um, so this is uh, what the modernist preacher is engaged in. And you may find if you go into a modernist church that they might quote from Confucius, they might quote from Buddha or you know, some of these great pagans, uh, of the past and try to find a moral wisdom in what they had to say because it's the religion of humanity and Jesus is being reduced to just one more voice among the chorus of the of, of humanity that's striving after a moral life a more perfect life so um, th this is uh, the effect of this wedding of uh, a pagan philosophy with Christian faith and the denial of the real person of Jesus. And uh, Machen affirms that if you go into the scriptures, and again, this is why your understanding of scripture is so pivotal and foundational. Uh, the scriptures are the inspired, inerrant word of God. They speak with authority, and you can trust the message about Jesus. And Machen doesn't just simply assert that. He gives uh, plentiful evidence of that uh, in, in his other books, which you, you can... And we'll probably get into that here as well. But the authority of Scripture is foundational to our understanding of uh, all these things. And so if we wish to understand Jesus, well, we do that through the testimony of Scripture. And it, it's really here where the modernist uh, seeks to evade the testimony of Scripture and go off on his own. And that's where uh, Machen comes in and says, you are anti-intellectualist. Uh, you're not willing to think carefully and deeply about the scriptures. You just, like, like the, the preacher that he speaks of here towards the end of the page 38, he, the preacher just takes a verse of scripture out of context and then just uses that, runs with that to uh, promote his own view or some socialist, essentially a socialist pagan view of the world around us. So... That's an anti-intellectual approach to Scripture. It's an unwillingness to wrestle with the evidence, the phenomena of Scripture, and deal with that. Let Scripture speak for itself, and then come to your conclusions, rather than just simply dismiss it and move on. So Machen continues, but, but can the human reason, especially as manifested in the historical sense, really be thus browbeaten into silence? For our part, we do not believe that it can. And when the reason awakes, though the modern religion of humanity may conceivably remain, its appeal to Jesus of Nazareth at least will have to go. We shall have to cease investing our pride in human goodness 
with the borrowed trappings of Christianity's emotional appeal. And the choice will have to be made between abandonment of Jesus as the moral guide of the race and acceptance of his stupendous claims. So here Machen is saying that if we listen to the dictates of reason and we use a critical analysis of the scriptures, we're going to come to a conclusion that Jesus is more than what the, the, the modernist is saying. He's more than just simply a good teacher who taught us to love one another. There's more to him than that. Uh, and so Machen is arguing we need to recover the use of reason in our religious investigations. Now, the one critique I'll have here of Machen a little bit, and it's not, I'm sure he would agree with this, but our reasoning needs to be grounded upon the Word of God, it needs to be grounded in faith. And it's Christian reasoning that needs to come in and evaluate these things, and not just a bare abstract faith in human reasoning. Because that human reasoning is founded on ungodly presuppositions quite often, which we're seeing working out here in the modernist point of view. So a mere appeal to reason on the surface of things I think is not entirely sufficient. It needs to be understood that true reasoning is reasoning that is grounded upon God's revelation of himself in the world and in scripture in particular. And the fact that we are made in the image of God and thereby given the ability to reason. Uh, based on the Logos of God, uh, the Son of God, who is uh, the light of men, as John says in John chapter 1. So, uh, be just mindful of the fact that just an outward appeal to reason may not entirely uh, be of help in fighting against the modernist preacher, because they're going to say, well, I am being reasonable. It's you who are being unreasonable in your faith in God and your faith in God's Word and that sort of thing. So, you know, th this reasoning needs to be grounded in uh, faith in God's revelation and, and these kinds of things. That's true reasoning. And I think that's what Machen, of course, would uh, argue for. But I just wanted to uh, make that brief note. Okay. Um, The last paragraph on page 39. Thus, the relinquishment of theology in the interest of non-doctrinal religion really involves the relinquishment of Christianity in the interest of a skepticism than which a more complete could scarcely be conceived. But another contrast has an equally baleful effect upon the life of the present day. It is the contrast between knowledge and faith. Here we go. And the consideration of that contrast takes us into the heart of our present subject. That contrast, as we shall see, ignores an essential element in faith. And that is what, and, and what is called faith after the subtraction of that element is not faith at all. As a matter of fact, all true faith involves an intellectual element. All faith involves knowledge and issues in knowledge. So now Machen is tying this idea of reason and knowledge into the foundation of faith. And you, you cannot just simply have uh, an assertion of faith without knowledge, without reasoning. A bare faith is not true faith because faith has to have uh, some intellectual content of one form or another in order for it to uh, be real. Uh, so... Uh, Progressing here, page 40. The exhibition of that fact will form a considerable part of the discussion that follows. It will not indeed form all of it, since the discussion will not be merely polemic, uh, that is, argumentative, uh, going against the ungodly points of view in the modernist church. But after all, the only way to get a clear idea of what a thing is, is to place it in contrast with what it is not. All definition involves exclusion. We shall endeavor, therefore, by comparison of opposing views, as well as by exhibition of our own, to arrive at an answer to the question, what is faith? If that question were rightly answered, the church, we believe, would soon emerge from its present perplexities and would go forth with a new joy to the conquest of the world. Okay, um, 
Uh, I'm tempted to jump in and make some comments here, but I'd be anticipating Machen, so let me just read him for another paragraph or so. There are those who shrink from a consideration of these great questions of principle. There are those who decry controversy and believe that the church should return to its former policy of politely ignoring or taking for granted the central things of the Christian faith. But with such persons, I, for my part, cannot possibly bring myself to agree. The period of apparent harmony in which the church in America found itself a few years ago was, I believe, a period of the deadliest peril. Loyalty to church, to church organizations, was being substituted for loyalty to Christ. Church leaders, who never even mentioned the center of the gospel in their preaching, were in undisputed charge of the resources of the church. At board meetings or in the councils of the church, it was considered bad form even to mention, at least in any definite and intelligible way, the cross of Christ. A polite paganism, in other words, with, rel with reliance upon human resources, was being quietly and peacefully substituted for the heroism of devotion to the gospel. So Machen makes a pedagogical point that if you want to uh, explain what something is, it's helpful to uh, explain it in contrast to its opposites. So what is a chair? Well, it's something that you sit on, but it's not um, a, a, something that you write a, a message on. The desk is not a chair. Um, and so you, you draw a contrast. And here in theology, it's important to draw a contrast between truth and falsehood. Uh, and so in my preaching, Rick's preaching, uh, a preaching of Orthodox Presbyterian churches, hopefully, generally speaking, there is a willingness to make a contrast, a willingness to identify false teaching and to call it false teaching, to say that the modernist point of view that's in uh, mainline Protestant Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran uh, churches, uh, teaching that you find in Roman Catholic churches, these are all falsehoods that lead people astray. The Arminian gospel that is in, that's in many evangelical churches is a false gospel, and it leads people astray from the true gospel, from Christ. Uh, and so uh, this uh, development whereby you say, this is what Scripture says, and it's contrary to what you find in the Roman church, in the modern church, in the Arminian church, uh, that is foundational for effective, I think, Christian preaching. And uh, you see that in Paul's letters time and again. He was not afraid of controversy. In fact, throughout his letters, he's consistently contrasting true faith, true belief, a true understanding of Christ with the falsehoods that were uh, at work in his churches. Uh, so he was fighting against the Judaism of the day and the idea that, well, you can supplement Christ with uh, circumcision and observance of the law and these kinds of things. It was contrary to the, the, uh, the uh, Gnosticism that was beginning to work its way into churches just in, in elementary form in, in saying that the material body is indifferent, it, it's evil, and, and all that counts is a spiritual life, and so you, you can... Uh, divide life and speak only of the spiritual self and physical things don't matter so you can live as you wish in the world. Uh, Paul contrasted these things with the truth of the gospel and even went on to say if anyone preaches another gospel than what I preached to you let him be accursed. Galatians chapter 1. I mean he was being very direct about that. So it's important for the Christian pastor uh, in caring for his congregation to be like a good shepherd and uh, to, to warn against the wolves that are out there in, in the field. Indeed, to take the staff of God's word and go after those wolves and attack them, defending the, the local congregation against these falsehoods. Not only those that are out there at large, but sometimes even within the church, even within the congregation, as, as different people begin to latch on to false ideas, they need to be corrected in a loving way, in a direct way, but faithfully and truly. And that's for the benefit and well-being of the church, for the protection of the church. And hopefully godly, faithful pastors will do that. 
and this is what Machen uh, brings up, and he, he puts it into a particular context. Um, you know, first, he, he, he notes how there's a, a, an interest upon, among many to avoid controversies and uh, just speak positively about things. Just present the gospel itself uh, and, and don't get into these controversial things because that divides people. It, it, it creates uh, frayed nerves and that sort of thing. And, and people like a, a peaceful environment, and so they don't want to be disturbed by these kinds of things. Uh, that's been a part of our church life here at, at First Church in Percocy. I, I've had uh, some in our church say that and, and leave the church eventually because I would not abide by that. Uh, I'm talking about a particular elder in mind here, um, maybe a couple. Um, at the same time, you know, uh, this is something that, that uh, there, a lot of people don't like controversy. They just want things to be nice and peaceful and just go along, you know. And so standing up, opposing, making it look like you're negative about everything, people don't like that. Just tell me something positive. It's like what Paul says about people wanting to accumulate teachers around them that, that tickle their ears and make them feel good. You know, oh, you're so good. You're so, uh, you know, you're, you're doing so well and all these kinds of things. Um, Paul warns against that sort of thing, and we need to be reminded of that ourselves. We need to stand forth for the truth and oppose error and be willing to get into battle with these kinds of ideas. It's not pleasant or easy at times, but it's something that we have to do. Um, you know, I, to put it in, in in a broader context, you know, that's like uh, Donald Trump. Uh, he was somebody who contrasted his views with those around him and was willing to point out the errors of those around him. <laughs> Whereas you think back on George Bush, he would let the 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 uh, critique of him in the press just go and just focus on positively on what he wanted to do and think, well, it, it's okay, just. Pay no attention to what the press is saying about you. Just keep a positive point of view and go forward. Trump battled with the press and he pointed out where they were wrong. And people didn't like it for, for like him for doing that. But it was essential. It created a contrast and the, indeed showed how the press was trying to destroy our culture by uh, making use of a, a, a socialist worldview and and trying to really put pressure on a conservative understanding of the country and its foundations and so forth. Now, I don't want to get too far into that, but just uh, Trump was very much a, a, a flashpoint for that kind of thing, and he was willing to do that. And uh, I'm not saying that preachers should be exactly like Trump, but we do need to, um, to stand for the truth and oppose error, and that's simply the point here. Um, Machen is writing in the context of the Presbyterian Church and how the Presbyterian Church was taken over in its administrative offices by people who were liberal in their point of view. And so you might have had a, a lot of more conservative pastors in, in the churches on the local level, particularly in the smaller churches. Um, but many of the influential positions uh, began going to bureaucrats who began to take over the, the seminaries and take over the denomination and its administrative end. And they were not at all interested in the preaching of the gospel. Uh, instead, they wanted control and they wanted everybody to follow along in the church. And so if you didn't do what the church wanted you to do, then you were driven out, whether what the church was doing was consistent with the word of Christ or not. And uh, Machen would particularly have in mind the uh, Foreign Missions Board of the church and the way that it was uh, not interested in confronting the paganism of the world with the gospel of Christ and the cross of Christ. And that's where he talks about how um, it, it was undignified to talk about the cross of Christ uh, within, within the administrative offices of the Presbyterian Church. And so he continues here, page 41, in the face of such a condition, there were some men whose hearts were touched. The Lord Jesus had died for them upon the cross, and the least they could do, they thought, was to be faithful to him. They could not continue to support, by their gifts and by their efforts, anything that was hostile to his gospel. 
and they were compelled, therefore, in the face of all opposition, to raise the question what it is that the church is in the world to do. And so Paul, uh, Machen is obliquely speaking of himself and others aligned with him who were upset with what was happening in the Presbyterian Church. That's the PC USA uh, today, the modern mainline Presbyterian Church. And so um, there were some that were who were willing to fight this. Um, and Machen goes on, God grant that question may never be silenced until it is answered aright. Let us not fear the opposition of men. Every great movement in the church from Paul down to modern times has been criticized on the ground that it promoted censoriousness and intolerance and disputing rather than equity and inclusion and what's the other one? Tolerance maybe. Of course the gospel of Christ in a world of sin and doubt will cause disputing and if it does not cause disputing and arouse bitter opposition, that is a fairly sure sign that it is not being faithfully proclaimed. As for me, I believe that a great opportunity has been opened to Christian people by the controversy that is so much decried. Conventions have been broken down. Men are trying to penetrate beneath pious words to the thing that these words designate. It is becoming increasingly necessary for a man to choose whether he will stand with Christ or against him. Such a condition, I for my part believe, has been brought about by the Spirit of God. Already there has been genuine spiritual advance. It has been signaled it's been signally manifested at the institution which I have the honor to serve. That's uh, Westminster Seminary that uh, he was instrumental in forming back in, what, maybe Rick can help me, 1927, something like that, 29? 29, 29, yeah, 29. That's right. I, I was trying to think of when I was a, a, a student at Westminster, uh, because they celebrated uh, in 79 the 50th anniversary, 50th anniversary. I guess. So mm -hmm. um, I was at Westminster at the time of that 50th celebration. Well, it won't be long till 100 years. Don't say that. <laughs> Yeah, you're you true. haven't been there. But <laughs> yeah, the institutions. But. Yeah, um, yeah. And so in 2029, so we are in 22. That's seven years from now. It'll be 100 years old. Pretty amazing, and still faithfully true. I think for the, on the whole, thank the Lord. Um, not without controversy along the years, but still true. Uh, it is to help in some small way to supply this lack that the present little book has been written. If the way of salvation is faith, it does not seem to be highly important to tell people who want to be saved just what faith means. If a preacher cannot do that, he can hardly be a true evangelist. How then shall we obtain the answer to our question, how shall we discover what faith is? At first sight it might seem to be a purely philosophical or perhaps psychological question. There is faith other than faith in Jesus Christ, and such faith, no doubt, is to be included with Christian faith in the name, in the same. Pastor Rich, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I think we, we skipped the part. We skipped here. a page. Yeah. yeah um, page, page forty-two. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I, I went two pages <laughs> instead of one. Yeah. Okay. We're on the other. I have the honor to serve, sort of maybe a third of the way down. Or I, I thought we were um, the, 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 starting with the. We're on the bottom of page forty-one, right? Reading through that paragraph, and the top so, of page forty-two. We're, we're on the top of page forty-two of the first. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I missed that, so. I okay. somehow skipped to page 44. I was in a hurry to finish the book. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> when I was a young student in high school at Philmont, in my first couple of years there, ninth and 10th grade, they gave us reading assignments for the summer, and one of them were like uh, uh, David Copperfield by Charles Dickens, and I had to read through that. And David Copperfield's like this thick. <laughs> yeah. And so I thought, ah, 
I, I read a page here and a page there. <laughs> Thought that'll be enough. <laughs> Never really did understand that book. So, Cliff back. Notes. Get the yeah, cliff the Cliff Notes. notes yeah. So I'm going back to old habits here. As for me, I believe that a great opportunity has been opened to Christian people by the controversy that is so much decried. Conventions have been broken down. Men are trying to penetrate beneath pious words to the thing that these words designate. It has become increasingly necessary for a man to choose whether he will stand with Christ or against him. Such a condition, I for my part believe, has been brought about by the Spirit of God. Already there has been genuine spiritual advance. It has been signally manifested at the institution that I have the honor to serve. The morale of our theological student body during the past years had been becoming rather low. I think he's speaking about uh, Princeton Seminary at that point. There was marked indifference to the central things of the faith, and religious experience was of the most superficial kind. But during the academic year of 1924 through 1925, there has been something like an awakening. Youth has begun to think for itself. The evil of compromising associations has been discovered. Christian heroism in the face of opposition has come again to its rights. A new interest has been aroused in the historical and philosophical questions that underlie the Christian religion. True and independent convictions have been formed. Controversy, in other words, has resulted in a striking intellectual and spiritual advance. Some of us discern in all this the work of the Spirit of God. And God grant that his fire be not quenched. God save us from any smoothing over of these questions in the interest of a hollow pleasantness. God grant that great questions of principle may never rest until they are settled right. It is out of such times of questioning that great revivals come. God grant that it may be so today. Controversy of the right sort is good, for out of such controversy as church history and scripture alike teach, there comes the salvation of souls. Unknown caller. All right. I'm sorry. Are you still there? Yep, we're here. Okay. Your picture just went off my screen because of a... Where can we go? You have the world's of eternal life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that was Christ that has those words. I'm just here to <laughs> pass them along. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, yeah. So I I was just going to check the the. Uh, yeah, this was published in 1925. So I was confused in talking about Westminster Seminary that started in 29 in reaction to the events that occurred there. So in 24 and 25 is the year in which. Machen is writing this book and getting it published, and he's seeing uh, within Princeton Seminary an interest among the students to deal with these things. Now, the, the history of Princeton will be that the administration gets replaced, and um, the, the authorities that be in the Presbyterian Church installed their own team of uh, administrators there at Princeton, which spelled the end of the conservative uh, influence at Princeton Seminary. So Princeton had a, a, a reputation for being um, the, the last bastion of orthodoxy for the most part in the mainline Presbyterian Church and they solved that by stripping the uh, administration uh, of conservative leaders, bringing in liberal leaders and then that spelled the end of Princeton and uh, within a couple years Machen will be forming Westminster Seminary with others who would leave uh, Princeton. Some would stay behind, interestingly, Gerhardus Voss, uh, a tremendous uh, professor, uh, stayed at Princeton and, and taught there for the balance of his years for, I think, another 10 years or so, into the 1930s at least. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, some think that Gerhardus Voss was kind of the father of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church to a certain extent because of his uh, theological developments. and. and you can root um, Cornelius Van Til to a certain extent and Gerhardus Voss and others. Uh, Voss didn't move on into Westminster Seminary and 
there, there's some questions about why that might have been, but he stayed behind. Uh, but at any rate, um, Princeton as a whole began to move in that liberal direction, and Machen decided it was time to start a new institution. Okay. Top of page 43. It is with such an ultimate aim that we consider the question, what is faith? A more practical question could hardly be conceived. The preacher says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But how can a man possibly act on that suggestion unless he knows what it is to believe? It was at that point that the doctrinal preaching of a former generation was far more practical than the practical preaching of the present day. I shall never forget the pastor of the church in which I grew up. He was a good preacher in many ways, but his most marked characteristic was the plainness and definiteness with which he told the people what a man should do to be saved. The preachers of the present time allude to the importance of becoming a Christian, but they seldom seem to take to make the matter the subject of express exposition. They leave the people with a vague impression to the effect that being a Christian is a good thing, but this impression is difficult to translate into action because definite directions are absent. These preachers speak about faith, but they do not tell what faith is. So it's like it's important to be named a Christian, but not to have the reality of what exactly it is to be a Christian. So just call yourself a Christian, become a member of the church, support the, the church and its institutions, pay your tithe regularly, and, and all's good. But what is it to be a Christian? It's not just to be a church member or to call yourself a Christian. It needs to be someone who follows Christ and believes in the atonement Christ provided at the cross. And those kinds of things are not, were not being taught in the mainline church in Machen's day, and I sincerely doubt they're being taught today. Um, it is to help in some small way to supply this lack that the present little book has been written. If the way of salvation is faith, it does seem to be highly important to tell people who want to be saved just what faith means. If a preacher cannot do that, he can hardly be a true evangelist. How then shall we obtain the answer to our question, how shall we discover what faith is? At first sight, it might seem to be a purely philosophical or perhaps psychological question. There is faith other than faith in Jesus Christ, and such faith, no doubt, is to be included with Christian faith in the same general category. It looks, therefore, as though I were engaging upon a psychological discussion, as though I ought to be thoroughly familiar with the, epistemologi the epistemological and psychological questions that are involved. Uh, what Machen is doing is, if we're going to follow the pragmatic approach to Christianity and just talk about the experience of faith without really defining what that faith believes, then you're only left with a psychological experience that you have to kind of talk about without the substance of faith itself. And so you're talking about an experience that you might have, and that's why in a modern day you hear politicians especially talk about communities of faith. Not really talking about the substance of the faith, but just you are a people of faith. You are a religious people, and we all have something in common in that we all have faith. And it doesn't particularly matter what your definition of yeah. God is or so forth. You don't define it. Yeah. I was, yeah. So, um, I mean, I've, I've heard people through the years, especially when I was chaplain at Springhouse Estates, oh, I have faith. I, I'm a person of I'm a person of faith. Yeah. And all, but they couldn't tell you what they believe about. Yeah. Many things. If you have faith, what do you believe? <laughs> Just, um, I'm spiritual. Yeah, I'm spiritual yeah, but not religious. Spiritual. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was another another word that's vague. Yeah. But basically, they're pantheists. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, um, 
I'm going to try to get through this chapter here so we can get started on the first new chapter. Undoubtedly such a treatment of the subject would be highly useful and instructive, but unfortunately I am not competent to undertake it. That's the psychological, epistemological evaluation of things. I propose, therefore, a somewhat different method of approach. How would it be if we should study the subject of faith not so much by generalizations from various instances of faith in human life, uh, though such generalizations will not be altogether absent, but rather by a consideration of faith as it appears in its highest and plainest manifestation. Such concentration upon a classic example is often the best possible way, or at any rate one very fruitful way, in which a subject is, can be treated. So if you want to study art, you might look at the great masters of painting, the Picassos, the uh, Da Vinci's, and so forth. Unknown oh, caller. Man. I'm sorry. The call comes in and it just strikes the video out of my way. Where is it? Okay, there you are. Um, so you, you study the masters, and that forms the foundation for a proper understanding of what true artwork is. You want to study literature, you study Shakespeare, Chaucer, uh, uh, John Milton, and, and others like that, so they can learn uh, what that's about. Um, these are ways in which you can advance uh, in your understanding, rather than just looking, I, I've got faith that this chair is going to hold me up, and so I'm sitting in it. That's faith. That's a general faith. But that is of marginal benefit to understanding what is Christian faith. Um, so continuing. But the classic example of faith is to be found in the faith that is enjoined or advanced, uh, encouraged in the New Testament. I think that there will be widespread agreement with that assertion among students of psychology, whether Christian or not. The insistence upon faith is characteristic of New Testament Christianity. There is some justification, surely, for the way in which Paul speaks of the pre-Christian period as the time before faith came. No doubt that assertion is intended by the Apostle as relative merely. He himself insists that faith had a place in the old dispensation, but such anticipations were swallowed up by the coming of Christ in a glorious fulfillment. At any rate, the Bible as a whole, taking prophecy and fulfillment together, is the supreme textbook on the subject of faith. The study of that textbook may lead to as clear an understanding of our subject as could be attained by any more general investigation. We can learn what faith is best of all by studying it in its highest manifestation. We shall ask, then, in the following chapters what the Bible, and in particular the New Testament, tells us about faith. So remember that the title of the book is, What is Faith? And so the, the, the general title that might suggest, well, I'm interested in a general understanding of faith and the way that it operates in a person's life. And faith in your spouse, faith in your church, faith in your government, and these kinds of things. And you can have a psychological discussion about all these different manifestations. That's faith. He has a specific concern in mind. What does the Bible tell us about faith? And this faith is not just a general faith, but it's true saving faith. And that's the focus of what we want to, to work with. And it's so important because that whole idea has been lost in much of what is outwardly Christian. It, it professes to be Christian faith in uh, these mainline churches and, and, and many other churches as well, but they've lost a grip on the Christ of Scripture. They've abandoned the, the, the work of salvation preached in the gospel, and they're really promoting a humanism under a, a religious facade with kind of a, a nod to Christianity and Jesus and the Spirit and these kinds of things. So I'll finish up there. And next willing, next week, God willing, we'll take a look at faith in God. And that too is going to be a lengthy chapter, another 40 pages. So buckle up. Um, we're just getting started. Um, all right, so I'll 
open the door to questions, comments, what have you. I got a letter from Katya, so while you're talking, I'm going to read. <laughs> no, I digress. <laughs> Multitasking. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Pay no attention to me. <laughs> oh, dear. I was wondering what, when you were talking at the beginning about the philosophies that end up infiltrating the culture and also, like, what would philosophy, if one was, if one was a cause, be brought about the idea that man is basically good? Um, or, or is that just innate, you know, just, just the way we are as, as sinners? Well, it's, it's certainly innate to human thinking. I, I mean, we might recognize that there is evil in the world. Look at Putin right now and what's going on in Ukraine. That's evil. We might be ready to recognize that. But we're generally very defensive as to ourselves mm -hmm. and saying, well, I'm basically good. Yes, I've got some faults and weaknesses, but my good works outweigh my bad. And so God being a good God, gracious God, will just put that aside, forgive me, and all's good. So I'm not too worried about um, meeting with God at the end of history if that's going to happen. Yeah, um, that, that may be one of those false ideas that are present in the mainline churches, you know, God is love, I'm basically good. Um, and I was thinking of it you know, earlier today, reading an article on, on, on the Fox News about um, how there, there used to be, we don't, we know, the military no longer has the idea of being able to support two wars at once, two yeah. conflicts at once. Yeah. And this goes back to, it was dropped that war theory, two war strategy was was uh, dropped by President Obama in favor of using trade and negotiation and diplomacy to avoid dual conflict. Yeah. But well, doesn't that stem from the idea that man is basically good? Yep. That we don't need a strong military. We can just do it with trade and diplomacy because people, you know, our enemies will understand it's in their best interest to trade and they're basically good. Yep. So it all stems from that. And I'm thinking, and then as you were talking about philosophies affecting our culture, so maybe there was a philosophy at one time that that started this, that started this idea that we don't, uh, that we can negotiate with evil. Uh, so it's, uh, it's it's interesting, but you see it working itself out in, in politics and everything else. I mean. Here, this Katanji Jackson or Brown, whatever her name is, is she? That's another story. She couldn't even define what a woman is. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's absolutely, it's, it's incredible. People are thinking that we're, we're basically good. We don't need to make distinctions and and have something be true. Uh, that's, uh, uh, Mike, you make an I, excellent uh, observation yeah. about so much involved. <laughs> Man, people have this idea of man's basic goodness, and that affects you politically. And, and Obama and, and the whole leftist mindset is basically a mindset that says that man is basically good, and that has consequences. Parental rights, you, you don't discipline your children, no corporal punishment. You know, you, you talk, you reason with the child, and, and you help them discover their own way because they're basically good. You go into uh, society, punish, crime and punishment. Well, sentences are too hard. You know, you got right now a lot of liberal judges trying to let criminals out on the streets. Uh, and you know, the emphasis is on reform rather than punishing uh, the criminal. The whole idea of the punishment for crime is being eviscerated in our, our culture today. Um, it, it's just, well, we've got to reform the individual, help them through counseling, through therapy, and these sorts of things to reform the criminal. Uh, but we can deal with that. Man is basically good, and so therefore we can work with it through education and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then with war, nations are basically good. We, we can talk to each other. We can negotiate. We can have diplomacy and that sort of thing. We can reason through our differences. And then if there are problems, again, uh, financial sanctions are... are and, and so we've moved under Obama from facing two wars to one war. 
and, and because, you know, this is kind of the icing on the cake. It's a little cheaper. It's a leaner, meaner military, as it were. We don't have as much uh, military equipment. We got half the number of battleships, I think, or something like that, or aircraft carriers than we used to have. And so your beliefs have consequences for your world. And it, if you have an Arminian uh, belief system, which says that man is basically good, this is what you're going to end up with, a socialist worldview and uh, really a violent world as people take advantage of the fact that you don't understand uh, the nature of man. But if you have a, an understanding that man is basically evil and it's restrained only by the image of God that yet remains in him and, and governments that uh, uh, punish evil, um, and then I think that you're skeptical uh, from claims by Russia that they, they're amassing troops on the, the border of Ukraine simply as a military exercise. <laughs> mm -hmm. Or that their, their incursion into Ukraine is simply a special operation <laughs> where they're bombing the blank out of the, the, the nation, you know. Um, it's just lies and, and people just buy it up, you know, and they become naive in what's going on. Mm -hmm. And well, look at the pictures of the Ukraine right now. Oh, Maripol and such. I mean, the, there's devastation everywhere. And, and you know, can you say that, that, that Putin is basically good? Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> when you see what he's doing to a yeah, country, right. yeah. a sovereign country, that, you know, that's just... if that's Biden's thinking or the administration's thinking... We've got a real problem in this yeah. country. Well, we're negotiating with Russia <laughs> and Iran, and Russia will be, if the deal goes through, they'll be getting billions of dollars out of that deal. Mm. And we're supposed to be sanctioning Russia and taking their money away to dry up the system. And it's like, what are yeah. you thinking? And you're feeding the enemy, which means we're going to have to spend more on defense measures and stuff like that. You know, it's like the, the military-industrial complex that Eisenhower warned of years ago. Maybe they're looking at this as a profit opportunity, you know. W w let's create a little skirmish over there and we'll sell our, uh, our, our weaponry and we'll make a ton of money doing that and who cares about <laughs> the rest of things. Yeah, or replace what we left in Afghanistan. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. we got to tax the money and tax yeah. the people. Money is so much the root of evil. <laughs> um, yeah. Just follow the money many times, like that fellow Schweitzer is doing with Clinton cash and other things. Man. <laughs> What's particularly interesting is that the criteria for nomination for a Supreme Court justice was a black woman. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. How do we know we got a black woman? How do we know? What is she? I guess she's a black thing. <laughs> what then? How about what? a qualified person who understands the, understands yeah. the Constitution and <laughs> understands the difference between male and female? I mean, yeah. we're expecting you to make careful distinctions of law, and you don't even know the difference between a man and a woman. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah. Huh? yeah. I, How can you? I don't want her. To, I don't want her to be a parent, let alone a right judge. Exactly. <laughs> You know, it's like, in my view, if you can't tell that an unborn child is a person worthy of being protected by law, you shouldn't be on the court either. I mean, it's a pretty plain and obvious thing that this is an unborn child, this is a human person that needs to be protected. And to deny that and say, well, it's just a, a you know, a thing in the woman's body, and it doesn't have any rights until it's born. Uh, to me, that disqualifies you from. You yeah, don't she have incriminated the, herself. Yeah, you don't have the moral capacity to make proper, basic distinctions and decide mm -hmm. on that. It's just like, man. I don't know what. What has she been judging for these years that she's been on a on a bench? Well, well, she hasn't been given proper justice because she hasn't been. Uh, punishing people according to the law. She's been given lesser sentences for sex offenders and other people.